Hey there, it's Michael Morgan here from Lathrop High School, and I'm here to give you some advice on how to get a five on the College Board's AP History tests. Now, there are already lots of videos on how to get a five on the AP World, Euro, or US test. However, I felt like I should share a few of my secrets that I use to help my students succeed uh, with their 90% plus pass rates, most of which are coming through the written portions of the AP test. Now, the first and biggest piece of advice I can give you to maximize your chances of getting a five on the AP, Euro, World, or US test are to master your knowledge of the key concepts concepts and the historical themes over time. The College Board has an extensive list for each of the three of all of the key concepts you need to know, as well as evidence and examples for those key concepts. And in fact, I've designed my entire class and materials around this concept. And if I had to choose one piece of advice to give you that would help bolster your chances of doing well on the AP test, it would be mastering those key concepts as well as those historical themes over time. It's additionally important to know the key concepts in the multiple choice questions because often when you look at the date and the location of the document in question, whether it's textual or visual, that is going to allow you to usually immediately eliminate one or two answers simply because the answers are at a completely different time or a completely different area, and that's going to, of course, reduce it to one or two or perhaps three possible correct answers. And that's going to be a massive help on the multiple choice as far as narrowing down which answer might be best. For example, if you look at the source and it's a 19th century document from France, you can almost immediately eliminate any of the one or two documents that aren't having to do with that time period or that region. So if one of my possible answers is Confucianism, I know right away that that is going to be out because that is China at a totally different time uh, rather than 19th century France. Secondly, after analyzing the date and location of that document, you should then read and analyze the document itself to narrow your uh, options. It should go without saying, but you should skip any questions that seem unclear, unclear or difficult as you only have 55 minutes, that's roughly one minute per question, and you do not want to be caught up trying to figure out a confusing or difficult question, you should be gunning for the easy points and going back to those more difficult questions. Additionally, I would strongly suggest circling the questions and answers that you skip, so not only that you do not miss them when you're going back and trying to fill in when you hear the warning, but that you can also use them to fill in for guesses. So at the five or 10 minute mark when the proctor has given you the five or 10 minute warning, you should immediately go back to all of those circled multiple choice questions that you didn't answer and fill them in because there are no missed points for guessing incorrectly. You should never have any blanks on your multiple choice sheet. So once you have them circled, you go back and fill them in after the five or 10 minute warning. And then you know specifically which questions you just gave a blind guess on. And for the remainder of your time, you can go back and actually try to figure out what the best answer is on those circled questions. That will drastically improve your odds of doing well, or at least better, on the multiple choice portion of the exam. Now for the written questions, the key is going to be time management and maximizing your points earned. Not completing entire sections. I know it might not look as pretty, but the point here is to earn as many points as you can in a small amount of time. Now you have three types of written questions. The first is a short answer question. You will have to answer two. And then for the third, you have a choice between two. So you will be answering three total in 40 minutes, giving you roughly 13 and a third minutes to complete each one. Each of those three short answers you have to answer is worth three points for nine points total. Now the long essay question is a single choice of three questions that span all the various periods of history, for whether it's world, euro, or US, and you have 40 minutes to complete that entire essay. Finally, there's the document-based question, which you have 60 minutes to complete. Now that is one single question you have to answer that is accompanied by seven documents that you have to read, analyze, and use for making your thesis and writing your essay. Now while I provide some excellent pieces of advice here in this video on the written questions, I would further suggest seeing my videos specifically on each type of written question where I go into more detail for the SAQ, the LEQ, and the DBQ, and I have linked those as well in the description below. Now for both the multiple choice and written questions, you should immediately write down the time you begin each section. This allows you to pace yourself knowing that, oh no, I've got to hurry up, or look, I have some leftover time, I can go back and double check my answers, maybe add more detail on a written question. Now much like the multiple choice, you should choose the easiest points to answer first for the short answer as offering as much detail as you can on each topic, and of course pacing yourself, and then use the time that you have left over after you've gone through and answered all the easy points to go back to the other parts of the question that were either unclear or confusing or that you just didn't know and that you can take a guess at. So to sum it up, focus on gunning for the easy points. Again, the goal is to try to maximize the amount of points earned, not complete entire sections. And the short answer section, uh, you've got nine possible points. So just go through, and if you can only answer one in each of the short answers or two, do that 
that and then go back and try to figure out the more difficult ones. Just like the multiple choice section, you can look for the date and the location of that document to give you a ballpark idea of what you should be discussing. And as well as the LEQ and DBQ types of questions, knowing the key concepts and historical themes will be used as evidence for your answer as well as to explain in your various written responses. Each type of essay will consist of one of three historical writing skills, and again, I'm talking here about the LEQ and DBQ, and those three historical skills that you're required to elaborate on are causation, which often asks for a cause and a series of effects or responses by people, as well as comparison, which you're going to be offering similarities and differences between ideas or periods, and lastly, continuity and change over time, which is how certain historical topics or themes have continued throughout time or they have changed throughout time, and again, I'm talking about the historical period periods that the class is divided up into. Now don't worry, the historical question is going to specifically state which skill you're using here, whether it's causation, comparison, or continuity and change over time. However, one specific piece of advice I want to give you that my students skip out on all the time is that if it is asking for causation, comparison, or continuities and change over time, it's always asking for two thing things. It's either asking for causes and responses or effects, it, or it's asking for similarities and differences, or it's asking for changes and continuity. In your thesis statement and in the body paragraphs, which are elaborations on that thesis statement, you have to discuss both. Do not provide three changes and no continuities or three differences and no similarities. You've got to have both in your thesis and in your body paragraph or you will have a bogus essay. One last point to add to the portion about the continuities and changes over time, comparison or causation is stick to that particular topic. An essay, whether it's an LEQ or a DBQ, it's not just historical trivia of throwing in random pieces of evidence and explaining them. They have to be relevant to your argument. And I realize that might be a difficult thing, especially if you're starting out with writing essays. However, However, it is key if you want to write a good essay that's going to get a good score, you have got to stick to what you're actually talking about. Again, this is not a random historical trivia essay. You are talking about specific continuities and changes or similarities and differences or causes and responses. Discuss those and those alone. If it's not related to that, don't discuss it. Now, aside from specific types of questions and strategies to use, I'm going to give you some general advice on preparing you for the AP test. The first and perhaps most critical is going to be spread out your studying over long periods of time. That means if it's January, February, or March, start studying now for that AP test. It's a phenomenon known as the spacing effect, which states that if you learn a little bit each day and you review that each day, you are much more likely to recall it quickly and more accurately across a longer period of time. Essentially, what I'm saying is don't rely on cramming. Now, there's nothing wrong with cramming to try to shove in as much information as you can at the last minute. However, it is far more efficient to study a little bit each day across time, and that will greatly enhance your actual memory and recall. Additionally, I would strongly suggest getting enough sleep in the days leading up to the AP test. Now, that means eight to nine hours. And you might be thinking, wait, that means less time for studying. And you're right, it is. However, if your brain is suffering from a deficit of sleep, which it can suffer from for up to two weeks if you don't catch up, you will think more slowly, you will remember things less efficiently, you will have inferior uh, problem solving skills compared to what you could be if you had enough sleep, and all of those will drastically harm your chances of doing well on that AP test. Now I'm not saying don't study the day before because you always want to cram in as much as you can, but you should prioritize sleep over cramming those last couple hours late at night. You want to wake up fresh and with a fully operational brain for that AP test. Hopefully these tips provide you with some insight on how to do well in the AP test. However, if you are looking for more materials to help you out with your knowledge of the content or with writing, feel free to check out my website, morganaptteaching.com, which is linked in the description below. Thanks for watching and good luck on the AP test.